Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of Sports Spectrum's podcast with Doc Emmerich, the legendary hockey broadcaster, is brought to you by Compassion International, the most trusted child development ministry in the world. For more information about how you can help release a child from poverty, go to the website compassion.com slash sports spectrum. Compassion.com slash sports spectrum. You see a list of children there and pray about it. Pray about sponsoring a child in Jesus' name. Really excited to welcome Doc Emmerich, NBC's NHL play-by-play voice to Sports Spectrum. He's the longtime voice of the NHL on NBC, known as America's Voice of Hockey, multiple Emmy Award winner. In 2011, he became the first member of the media to be inducted into the United States Hockey Hall of Fame. And in December 2019, December 17th, 2019, Mike Doc Emmerich was inducted into the Sports Broadcasting Hall of Fame. He's been doing this a long time. He began his broadcasting journey in college at Bowling Green in 1971 and broadcasted his first professional hockey game in 1973. This guy's a legend. You're going to love hearing his story. Mike Doc Emmerich, NBC's NHL play-by-play voice. Take a listen to Doc Emmerich here on Sports Spectrum. Doc Emmerich, welcome to Sports Spectrum. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, and it's always wonderful to talk to people like yourself. It's so great to have you here, Doc. And you can now add the title of Sports Broadcasting Hall of Famer to your resume because it was just a little while ago, December 17th, 2019, you were recently inducted into the Sports Broadcasting Hall of Fame. What was that experience like? I have to imagine it was a pretty cool moment. Yes, it was. Uh, I was in a room with a lot of people who had either received the award, uh, were receiving it that night, or who were legends in the industry. But also, I was in the room with my wife and my nephew and his wife. And it's rare in life that you spend a lot of time with your broadcasting colleagues And you spend a lot of time with your family, but it is rare that they are all in the same place at one time. And that is a real rare moment when the circles of your family and your and your professional family intersect. And so that was one of those unusual nights. And so those stick in your memory a long time. Well, another thing that sticks in the memory of those that have heard you or watched you or listened to you over the years are all the amazing opportunities and games that you've gotten to call in your 40 plus year career broadcasting professional hockey. I'm wondering, because I'm sure you have had a chance to kind of reflect on this, is there one or two games or a few moments that stand out as the highlight sort of of your broadcasting career? No, I I don't think so. But that, of course, um, seems to duck your question. Uh, I, you know, I, uh, what I could do is, is probably draw recollections of a couple or three, uh, and, and give you a shorthand of some of them. Uh, Sidney Crosby scoring an overtime in the gold medal game for Canada against the U.S. in Vancouver is one of the games that I, I often remember. The first time that the women played for, uh, Olympic medals in 1998 in Nagano in the Olympics. And one of the rare times they have never beaten Canada in international competition, in major international competition, going into that tournament. And they did it in back-to-back games, including for the gold medal. Uh, that'll stand out in my mind and still does for a long time. Uh, Brian Williams uh, had a news program on Friday nights in addition to anchoring the NBC News uh, during... Uh, one of the lockouts that we had in the NHL, and he thought since his daughter was a hockey player, uh, he thought it would be fun, since I wasn't doing anything uh, at the time, to send me out to do uh, a youth hockey game. And uh, I live near Detroit, so he sent me to Troy, Michigan, and he thought it would be even more fun if it was a girls' game. And it was one of the best nights I ever remember spending inside an arena. It was an under-12 girls game. Uh, 
Doug Brown, who had uh, won a Stanley Cup, or maybe more than one now, as I recollect, was coaching one of the teams. It was the Troy Sting against the St. Clair Shores Saints. And the NBC folks have done tremendous research in advance. I was given an opportunity to go into the dressing room and talk to the girls before the game, which, you know, in NHL rooms, why there's an embargo 90 minutes before you can't go in. I went in right before the game, and uh, one young lady was a concert violinist. This was just an activity for them. And uh, another one wanted to be a veterinarian, and she had uh, a dog, two cats, and hermit crabs. And, of course, I wanted to know more about, I, I didn't know what hermit crabs even looked like. And she said, uh, I said, what do, what do they eat? And she said, rolled up bits of lettuce. So I made sure that that got on in, during, the, uh, during the taping of the game. But that was, that was probably, that, that was the joy of hockey played by people who weren't probably going to do anything more than, than play it for fun the rest of their lives, but also go on and, and do other things in their lives besides that, which uh, took me back to the roots of what the sport is like for many people who don't become professionals. Uh, so I guess those would be three of the, three of the games that come to my mind right off. I love that. As a guy who's been in the broadcasting business 20 plus years myself, I just love hearing the stories and the moments and the memories that stick out. I wonder for you, do you remember the very first hockey game that you ever broadcasted? Yeah, uh, it was in uh, Toledo, Ohio. Um, if, if you discount the two years of doing Bowling Green college games, and I guess I shouldn't probably toss that aside. Um, if I if I go back to that, that would have been in 1971, in October of 1971. Uh, I was in a doctoral program at Bowling Green, and when I was exploring going there or to the University of Michigan, because I had offers of assistantships at both places, uh, Terry Shaw, who was the um, uh, director of uh, sports programming at, at the Bowling Green public station, said, if you come here, you can do the second period's of the Bowling Green games, I do the first and third, and we always have a student do the second. He just graduated, so that made up my mind for me. And it was Bowling Green versus Ryerson College. Uh, Ryerson is uh, near Toronto. And uh, so that would, that would have been the very first, and the first professional game was Port Huron's flags at the Toledo Hornets in October 1973. The score was 6-5, to five and Port Huron won. On a left circle blast by Dale Dalmage. Oh, you remember the first one, that's for sure. Yeah, if I just pull out a game in 1983, you're probably not going to remember it. But that first one, everything sticks out, right? Yeah, and and it, it, it registers with you the rest of your life. And it's interesting, you, you uh, talk to any player and you ask him about the first game he ever played. And if he was a defenseman, who his defense partner was. And if he was a forward, uh, who, who he was on a line with. And almost all of them will be able to tell you because it resonates with them for the rest of their lives. And the tradition in the NHL, unless there are extenuating circumstances and it was a, a scratch after an injury in the warm-up and you got put in your first game, you know, by accident, usually the parents are there and family members are there because it, it becomes quite an event. And so that, for that reason... Um, they all remember a lot of detail about that first game. Second one, maybe not, but the first game they do. It's kind of like a first date, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very similar. Doc Emmerich is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. Okay, so we intersect the world of sports with the world of faith, Doc, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have you on. I know your faith in Christ is important to you. Can you share with us about your journey of faith and take us to why uh, why that's so important to you? Well, in goes back uh, to my childhood in Indiana. I was, I was raised by parents who, um, in the United, well, it wasn't called the United Methodist Church at the time. It was the Methodist Church. And my yeah. brother and I were in church every Sunday, and so we knew nothing else. But obviously, you know, by osmosis, that helps. But it's still a choice that you have to make yourself. And um, I think I was probably single digits uh, at the time. And um, I just, um, it was a decision I made. There were a series of meetings at our church. They were not, they were, they were not necessarily emotionally charged meetings at all. It was just a quiet decision that I made. 
And um, uh, the uh, man who was the speaker at the meetings was a very quiet man named Reverend Barker. I can't remember his first name. And um, my mom and I uh, spoke with him after one of the services was over. Uh, he asked me to read a passage from First John. And I think because I was young, he wanted he, he just wanted me to understand what I was saying and what I was, you know, the, the decision I was making. And when he was satisfied with that and he spoke with my mom about it, we shook hands and that was it. Now, of course, then comes leading the life. Yeah. And that is an imperfect uh, chore that you set out on, uh, as we all find every day. But I have had a number of people who have been trailblazers for me, especially in the sports life, uh, that have uh, that have have helped me see uh, and and continually refocus on what the faith life is like. And one of those was a wonderful broadcaster for years named Ernie Harwell. Sure. Ernie founded the baseball chapels. He co-founded them. Uh, and he, and, and of course the basis of that, and uh, I'll let you refocus me if I'm starting to get off the track here. But um, the basis of that was that baseball players played Sunday afternoons almost exclusively because night baseball on Sunday was, was never done. And so as a result, they had to be at the ballpark early. They couldn't go to church services. And so he established, uh, co-established the baseball chapels so that players could meet together from opposing teams and have one service on Sunday morning so that they could share their faith and also um, um, uh, read the Bible together and, and, and at least have a moment uh, to observe their faith once a week. And, uh, but uh, I had a chance when I was working on my doctoral dissertation at Bowling Green uh, on the history of baseball announcing and on the profession of baseball announcing itself, something that I did not have an interest in, but it was an untapped subject, which for a doctoral dissertation you need, yeah. He was my um, he was my non academic advisor for my dissertation, so I got to spend some time with him. And far more significant than the role that he had in being my non academic advisor was the role that he had of me just watching how he interacted with people. Hmm. And I think that is probably the best way to say the faith role that he played in my life and what I try to, uh, what I try to follow each day. Uh, that's, I guess that's the only way I can say it. I love that story. And we talk about uh, the great commandment and the great commission a lot, Doc, on this podcast and on Sports Spectrum. The great commandment, of course, being love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then the Great Commission, which is Jesus telling us to go out and make disciples. But we can't forget the Great Commandment, and that is to love others as ourselves. You talk about Ernie Harwell. How did him modeling that help you in your walk, in your journey early on as, as a broadcaster? Well, and he had time for people, and he, people knew where he stood, However, he was not one who would grab them by the wrist and would try to proselytize by force because he realized that this was a choice that everyone made. And I think that, too, is something that I interpret as being part of what we do is to respect and love other people. And not everyone is raised in the same way that we are. Not everyone has the same faith traditions. For that reason, I still feel that part of what we do is to encourage others in their own faith journey, whether they are raised in the same traditions uh, as we are or not. And 
obviously, if they have and see something in us that raises questions in their minds or in a way that we can help, then that is where we can step in and tell them what it means in our life. And that was the way that Ernie was. He would speak at chapels, and of course you knew how he felt. And when you asked what his beliefs were, he shared wonderfully. I think that's what appealed to his expression of faith to me. That's what appealed to me, and I've tried to share in the same way. But I also realized that uh, a lot of what we can do is to encourage others in their own faith journey. Doc Emmerich is our guest here on Sports Spectrum. Doc, are there any sort of rhythms or disciplines that you instill into your spiritual journey, into your connection with God during a long hockey season, things that you just have to do pretty much every single day to stay connected with them? Well, it, you know, everyone has their own way uh, in each day and in their preparation for games. And so I have a series, um, I have a three-ring binder, which in the middle has the lineups of both teams. For example, the next game that I have is the Winter Classic in Dallas. And the visiting team on the left will be in purple, and that'll be Nashville. And that'll be the two goalies, if you can, if you can imagine... Um, maybe I shouldn't go into too much detail. How much time do we have? <laughs> Ten more minutes, but you got time. Sure. Oh, okay. Uh, so anyway, the two goaltenders for uh, uh, Dallas, Rene and Saros, will have their numbers and names in the upper left corner. Then there are squares, 14 squares, two rows, to accommodate 28 names. You're only allowed to dress 20, but there are always extras on the roster. So then in numerical order... Um, are, are the rest of the uh, field players, if you will, in numerical order down. On the left side of the visiting team and then on the right side in green will be the Dallas Stars. Same sort of thing. Well, that's in the middle of the book. And then there are biographical notes on both teams underneath uh, on preceding pages of the visiting team Nashville. There'll be notes on individual Nashville players in case I need them. And on the opposite side, uh, in following pages of the Dallas lineup, there'll be notes on the Dallas players. At the front of the book, there are not only pictures of uh, my wife and family members um, and our dogs and horses and things like that to reconnect me with the fact that I, am, you know, I, I do have wonderful, uh, wonderful support people in my life, but also some, some prayers um, that are brief some only a couple of paragraphs, many of them written by a great prayer writer named Norman Vincent Peale, who was the creator of Guidepost magazine. And normally at the end of the warm-up, which is 30 minutes before the game, and then it ends 15 minutes before the game takes place, and normally that's before we sign on the air, I will, uh, I will, will usually try to focus and recite one of those prayers. Um, uh, for example, it, um, one of them goes, uh, put your quieting touch upon our distressed minds that we may become calm. We do not ask to escape the demand of a difficult world. We ask to be better able to deal with them. Come into our minds and hearts and give us new insights, new understanding, and a new sense of power to overcome any problem. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. That was one that Norman Vincent Peale wrote a long time ago, and it is one that I remember reciting before. I believe that was the one I remember reciting to myself before Wayne Gretzky's last game. Katie Ledecky, the five-time Olympic gold medalist, um, I have a quote from her near the front of my book that said, more than anything, Praying helps me concentrate and let go of things that don't matter at the moment. It gives me peace knowing I'm in good hands. I think people would recognize if their announcer wasn't calm. And I think that's what prayer before a game represents for me. That doesn't mean I'm not going to be calm 100% of the time, or at least, you know, not excited. Uh, there's a difference between being tense and being excited. And our sport is very exciting. But we get curveballs thrown at us 
this is not a scripted event, hockey, and the game can get confusing at times, and you make mistakes, and you get aggravated at yourself. But overall, what I think that calmness uh, that I often receive from prayer uh, brings helps me be a better announcer and hopefully a better communicator for the people who are watching. Uh, I have had, since I was a teenager, um, um, the publication called The Upper Room that I do read from and others in the morning. But uh, before a game, it's just become, I guess, part of part of habit. It's I don't think it's superstition. I think it's just part of habit that I need to rechannel myself just before I go to work uh, to do that. Doc, is there a Bible verse or a piece of scripture that you stand on, that you stay connected to God with? It's your go-to, something that continues to resonate with you on this journey with the Lord? Well, um, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I think we're, we're often all trying to find out, you know, what the purpose is. I, I feel blessed that I get to do a job. I, Ernie said... I, you know, I, the, the gospel according to Ernie Harwell, a man is lucky or a woman if God gives him a job to do that he enjoys. And that was something that he said a long time ago. And I just, it, this is my 47th year of being paid to broadcast hockey games. And I just, I marvel at the fact that I've been through cancer and a lot of other you know, calamities that anyone my age, 73, would have encountered. I mean, when you get to be this old, you are grateful that you have lived this many years, but you also realize that uh, the law of averages says you're going to have some calamities along the way. So that's, so I, I'm, I'm very grateful that I've been able to continue to do this, and I'm thankful that I can. To make it a little lighter before we say goodbye, how are you feeling about your Pittsburgh Pirates? Yes, um, <laughs> we have had an, uh, we have had a managerial change. Clint Hurdle, a very devout Christian, as a matter of fact, uh, relieved of his duties on the final day of the season. Yeah. Uh, I will admit, I'm glad that I have Clint's friendship, and I imagine he will resurface and manage another team someday. Uh, the Pirates have had. Uh, a calamitous. Uh, I've been a fan since 1959, so I saw 30 really good years, yeah. and uh, then uh, the last 30 haven't been so good. So I guess I, I can't complain on balance, but I sure would like to see them in another World Series before I shuffle off. I, I just don't think that's going to happen. The structure of baseball is such that it's it's a very expensive sport, and there are only uh, some owners are willing to uh, to spend the money, and others are not. And uh, I have an owner who is not really willing to spend. Yeah. But we haven't lost a game since early October, <laughs> and so I am going to go to games in spring training. Uh, NBC uh, does allow me to to uh, uh, go down and see a few games in Florida in in March. And uh, so I, I get to go see some spring training games, and I will be as optimistic as any other fan that maybe this year it'll be different. But we do have to play 76 games in the Central Division, and those will be tough. Yeah, it's a tough division for sure. Yeah, you got a chance to call quickly a, a game a couple years ago with Bob Costas in 2016. What was that experience like? That's not hockey, but that must have been a pretty cool experience. It was wonderful, and I will never do it again because it was so perfect. Oh, wow. It is the it is the greatest gift one announcer can give to another, what Bob gave to me. Uh, he enabled me to do a game of my team. MLB Network, thanks to Bob, waived impartiality for one night. And so I could cheer for my team on the air, and they won the game with the Cubs. I think they beat the Cubs four times <laughs> that entire season out of 19 games. But that was one of them. That was, and it. it was a great experience. I love it. Doc Emmerich's been our guest here on Sports Spectrum. Thanks so much for your time, Doc. Last question: We ask this to all of our guests here. It's a deep question if you want to take it that deep. But what has God been teaching you where you are right now in the season of life that you're in? What are you learning from the Lord? That um, 
Patience is a wonderful virtue, and you need to relearn it almost every day. Wow. Short and sweet. I love it. Doc Emmerich, thank you so much for being here on Sports Spectrum. We really do appreciate your heart for the Lord and just appreciate your time and joining us. Let's catch up again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great to talk to you. Really enjoyed that conversation with the legend himself, Doc Emmerich, the Sports Broadcasting Hall of Famer, joining us here on Sports Spectrum. Hey, listen, all you got to do is turn on a hockey game on a Sunday afternoon on NBC and you'll hear Doc Emmerich's voice. And when the playoffs come, there is nobody better to watch in, in really in sports, in my opinion, than a playoff hockey game with Doc Emmerich calling the play by play. He is truly a legend and we are grateful and thankful to have him join us here on Sports Spectrum. We're also thankful to our sponsors, Compassion International, the most trusted child development ministry in the world. For more information about how you can help release a child from poverty for $38 a month, tax deductible, go to the website, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and pray about sponsoring a child. I promise you it's the best decision you'll make in 2020 is sponsoring a child in Jesus' name through Compassion International. Pray about it and consider sponsoring a child today. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. Check out our social media pages. You can reach us there on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can sign up on our YouTube channel as well. All sorts of content out there available to us. And if you tweet us and DM us, certainly follow us. Uh, like what we're posting, retweet, whatever, we see it. So if you want to send us a direct message, we see that. Any ideas you have for a guest here on Sports Spectrum, any feedback you have, you can even email me directly if you'd like, jason at sportspectrum.com. I'd love to hear from you. We've gotten so many wonderful emails in the past few years since we've been doing this Sports Spectrum show. And listen, We so appreciate it when we know somebody out there is listening and hearing these stories of sports and faith. So thank you for listening. We'll see you next time with a brand new episode here on Sports Spectrum. Have a great rest of your day.